Hello and welcome to Fireside History. Today's episode will be discussing two of the sons of Shupi Lulumish, namely Telepinu, who became priest of Kizuwatna, or as most historians tend to call him, the viceroy of that region. Now, Telepinu is the first son we'll be dealing with. The next son we'll deal with after we've discussed Telepinu at length, after I've talked about him a little. Now, Shupi Lumish had five sons, Arniwanda, Telepinu, Piyoshili, Zananza, and Mershali. Now, the thing is, Arniwanda, as the eldest, was the crown prince. And he had been designated as heir since the very start of the reign. But Telepinu remained a bit of a... Uh, like, like all fathers with too many sons, he wondered what to do with his spare heirs. And the thing with Telepinu was Shubi Lumish arrived upon a brilliant uh, idea on how to handle the succession. He removed his second son from the succession, meaning he could not become king. That said, Telepinu was given command of his own uh, sub-kingdom within the kingdom, so to speak. But he was put into the priesthood. And the thing is, Telepinu was a pre great priest, but he could still marry and have kids, unlike the Christian priests of later centuries. And as commander of this region, he exercised a great deal of influence in his father's name over that part of Anna, of the kingdom. And this appointment was made only a short time before Shupi Lumish invaded Syria. So it was very likely that the father wanted to, act, to put the son's considerable talents to good use. Because Telepinu would later prove himself one of the most able-bodied uh, Hittite princes of all times. He was a brilliant, brilliant administrator. Uh, obviously, his administrative and political skills were needed to help prepare for the military campaign that was to come. Now, his appointment, um, his appointment also meant that he was out of the way from the new Tawanana. Now, Henti, um, Henti, uh, had, was the mother of all these boys. All five of them, it seems. And the contrary to the Anatolia Red River, uh, Anatolia story, Red River uh, manga, which, while a incredible story and very good in its own right, is not historically accurate as far as we know when it comes to the sons. Doubtlessly, Shubilumish did have a harem, though. I would actually hedge all my money on that and say there's no way he didn't. Now, Telepinu would remain in his post for the rest of his life and was appointed by decree of Shubiliumish, the Queen Ta Henti, Arnuwanda, and Shubiliumish's brother Zita, the chief of the bodyguards. Now, the thing is, when Henti was removed from her post, the thing is, you wouldn't want her family to really run into conflict with the new Tawanana. This might create political division and factions, and Shubilumish was an able-bodied politician who could see the problems here. Now, some people might say, well, he's given feudal control over a region to a son who might have a problem with the Tawanana. Yes, but he's also directed his attention and energies towards an enemy, that is to say, the forces in Syria. Now, the next son that Telepinu later decided to kind of get rid of out of the succession, I imagine there was, just as, you know, he needed to remove Telepinu from the capital, also to facilitate Arnu Nwanda's um, position as crown prince, he obviously needed to remove Pia Shili, or as he renamed him once he was appointed to a post in Carchemish, 
as a new sub king of Karkamish or viceroy there. Uh, Shari Kushu. Now, this is a more Hurrian name or Syrian name and whatnot, but the thing with Shari Kushu is he became a favorite of Shupilulumish's uh, success, eventual successor, as well, well, so did Telepinu. Both men exercised considerable authority over uh, Mershali II, so that it was almost a partnership. Rather than him ruling over the others, it was almost like you had a triumvirate ruling and running everything throughout the kingdom and keeping everything in tip-top shape. And all three men were incredibly talented. They were geniuses in their own right. And I would rank all three almost, not quite, but almost on par with the father, which um, that just goes to show how talented and they were, and how wise Shupilumish had raised his sons. He obviously knew how to harness their talents. And as we find out in the Zanansa affair, he likely also had a considerable amount of affection for his boys, um, who were hardly boys by this point. But Shari Kushu, when he succeeds as head of Karkamish, um, has a large region under his command, possibly larger than Telepinu, and is really kind of supervising Syria in a way, as, well, as Syria was always a trouble spot for the Hittites. And, you know, you needed someone there on the field who can interfere and intercept any kind of invasion or kind of conflict from that area against the uh, heartland of the empire. And we really ought to be starting to call this an empire now because it's no longer a kingdom because it's growing out of, well, it's growing so large uh, for the time period. And Shupiliumish obviously had imperial aspirations and you've got, he's really setting up sub kingdoms under the great king's command because they didn't have the title of emperor. They had the title of great king at the time, in Mesopotamia. So, you know, you have these satellite kingdoms that are there to ward off external threats, uh, help ease the burden of administration, and this is a brilliant tactic on Shupilumish's part. It reforms Hittite policy and allows for, yes, it introduces far more feudalism in a way, but it allows for the kings to arrange uh to have a bit of a lesser Hittite kingdom in each region that so as to inspire local loyalty and towards the overall Hittite empire. So, and as these are his sons, and as he raised all his sons to be fairly loyal to one another, there's a, a great deal of, of cooperation that starts to happen. And as each son was incredibly talented and in their own rights in military, uh, religious and political and administrative affairs, you pretty much had the ship running smoother than it ever will in the Hittites' history. And it's sad to say, but after Shari Kushu and Telepinu and even Mershali's deaths, things fall apart. Well, not exactly immediately, but, well, it does fall apart. But at the moment, everything's going great. Shubilumish is appointed Telepinu. Then later, um, after several of his wars, he appoints uh, Sharikushu once he comes of age. But Sharikushu is... Um, now he's removed from the succession. So really, now with Zananza not in the picture eventually, you have... I can't give too many spoilers there, but I just did, I guess. You have Arnuwanda and only Mershali left in the succession, oldest and youngest sons. But it turns, I wonder if this was part of the goal Shupilumish had to a limited extent, because Mershali was his greatest son. He was the most talented. Sure, he probably wanted Arnuwanda to have sons and to succeed to the throne and whatnot. But the thing is, should the end come for Arnuwanda all of a sudden, at least Mershali will be waiting in the wings and as the most talented son who does not yet have a kingdom and is not yet removed from the succession, he could ease up into the throne and onto the throne and rearrange uh, the ship of state should anything go wrong. 
So we'll find out how everything goes down over in Syria with Telpinu now in control of a region and of, well, of Kizuwatna and Shupalumash once again aiming for Syria. So if you like this video, like, share, subscribe, and leave a comment.